This is the Podvig, a weekly podcast containing reflections and encouragement from Holy Scripture, the saints, their lives, and the hymnody of the Holy Orthodox Church for your Podvig, that is, for your spiritual struggle in the war against the passions. And I am Joel Dunn. Let's get to it. Hey y'all, happy Thanksgiving everyone. In this episode I'd like to tell you about America's real first Thanksgiving, which you probably don't even know about. In the spring of 1618, four gentlemen met in London, England to negotiate the formation of a new company, the Berkeley Company, and to start a town and plantation in the colony of Virginia. They had received a grant from King James I for 8,000 acres there. And so, on September 16th, 1619, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the good ship Margaret set sail from England. The vessel weighed 47 tons and was 35 feet long, and it carried 55 souls. Captain John Woodleaf, 19 crew members, and 35 settlers. The Margaret arrived at the Chesapeake Bay on November 28, 1619, which was on the Lord's Day. They proceeded up the James River and finally dropped anchor at their destination on December 4th, 1619. Back in England, the Berkeley Company had provided a list of ten instructions. The very first instruction was that upon landing, they give a prayer of thanksgiving for their safe voyage, and to do so annually and perpetually thereafter. As soon as they disembarked the Margaret onto the Berkeley Hundred, they immediately were called to prayer by Captain Woodleaf, who proclaimed, We ordain that the day of our ship's arrival at the place assigned for the plantation in the land of Virginia shall be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. America's first thanksgiving occurred one year and seventeen days before the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, and almost two years before the pilgrims held that three-day harvest feast commonly considered to be the first thanksgiving. But in Virginia, the annual day of Thanksgiving was strictly a religious observance, dedicated to prayer. It was a solemn affair, not a harvest feast. When Christ instituted the New Covenant, he initiated it by first giving thanks, which in Greek is the word Eucharist. In the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, we read, And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread, and gave thanks, and brake it, and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This was also not a harvest party, at which Christ or the disciples made merry. No, this was a ceremonial institution of Christ's sacrificial offering for the salvation of mankind. Chapter 7 of the book of Leviticus outlines the law of peace offerings, which were offered for thanksgiving to the Lord. In the Septuagint, the Greek word chosen to translate the word peace here is Soterios, which is a derivative of the word that means saving or salvation. Leviticus chapter 2 completely forbids any leaven or honey being burned in any burnt offering to the Lord. This is because leaven and honey typify sin and corruption. According to St. Jerome, honey is a sign of pleasure and sweetness, which always brings death. Sensuality, as such, is never pleasing to God. This is the reason that neither honey nor wax is offered in the sacrifices of the Lord, and that oil, the product of the bitter olive, is burned in his temple. Likewise, Christ's voluntary sacrifice was neither sweet nor sensual, 
the bitter cup of death did not pass from him. And though his death brought forth salvation, for some it brings forth condemnation. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So with this in mind, listen to these words of thanksgiving from the wisdom of Sirach. Ascribe majesty to his name, and give thanks to him in praise, with songs on your lips, and with lyres. And thus you shall say in thanksgiving, All things are the works of the Lord, for they are exceedingly good, and every command shall be in his appointed time. No one can say, What is this? Why is that? For every question will be answered in his appointed time. By his word the waters stood as a heap, and the reservoirs of the waters by the word of his mouth. By his command all his good pleasure is done, and no one will diminish his salvation. The works of all flesh are before him, and nothing can be hidden from his eyes. From age to age he looks upon them, and nothing is marvelous to him. No one can say, What is this? Why is that? For all things were created for their uses. His blessing covers the dry land like a river, and drenches it like a flood. As he turns fresh waters into salt, so the heathen will inherit his wrath. As his ways are straight to the holy, so they are an occasion of stumbling to the lawless. As from the beginning good things were created for the good, so evil things for sinners. The basic needs of a man's life are water, fire, iron, salt, and wheat flour, and milk, honey, the blood of the grape, olive oil, and clothing. As all these things are good for the godly, so they turn into evil for sinners. There are spirits created for vengeance, and in his anger they strengthen their scourges. In the time of consummation they will pour out their might, and appease the wrath of him who made them. Fire, hail, famine, and death, all these things are created for vengeance. The teeth of wild animals, scorpions, and snakes, and the avenging sword that derives the ungodly to destruction. They shall be glad at his commandment, and be prepared for his service on earth. And when their times come, they will not transgress his word. Therefore, from the beginning I was determined and resolved, and left this in writing. All the works of the Lord are good, and he will supply every need in its hour. No one can say, This is worse than that, for all things will be well-pleasing in their time. So now sing praise with all your heart and voice, and bless the name of the Lord. Wisdom of Sirach 39.15-35 But what exactly does all this have to do with thanksgiving? Well, hopefully it helps us reorient our minds so that we may truly understand how and in what context God wishes to receive our thanksgiving. As he is loath to receive offerings marred by sin and sensuality, so we must strive to offer thanks to him in purity, which is wrought through the fire of tribulation. Thus, in all things, we can and must truly give thanks. In the words of St. Paul, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Thank you so much for listening. Please rate, subscribe, and share this podcast with friends, family, or anyone else you think might benefit from it. You can support the podcast or send me a message through the link that is in the description of this episode. And please join me again next time as we make our sojourn on the Podvig of life.